you know, I've talked about the ingrained cultural stereotypes. We have gender biases and, of course, outright sexism that still exists, even though we're really pushing to level the playing field, so to speak. So what does this really mean in a practical sense? We think about the generalizations that lead to misconceptions. So what someone should look like. I work with some of the Rugby 7 women, and we've done a couple of studies from a, a sociological perspective. Because one of my good friends and colleagues is a sociologist in New Zealand. And one of the things that comes up is in order to be successful on the rugby field, you have to have a certain amount of muscle, you have to look a certain way, because it, your sport dictates that to be at a high level as an Olympian. And that's how they look and that's how they are revered on the field. But then award night comes and they put on a cocktail dress and the haters come out. You look like a man, what are you doing? And so they're same fans that love and revere them on the field, looking very masculine in sport, will turn around and hate on them when they are in a dress because it's a dichotic switch of image. So we have to understand what that generalization, that misconception of what do I look like to be successful in my sport versus what does society think I need to look like? and we still have that gender bias and that discrepancy. Then when we start getting into like return to play, we know that concussion guidelines are different and they should be different for men and women. But yet when you're looking specifically at the guidelines, they don't differentiate. We know that if a woman is hit in the high um, phase or the high hormone phase of her menstrual cycle, she'll have more post-concussive syndromes that last longer period of time but that's not necessarily taken into account when we're looking at return to play guidelines because it's not written into the guidelines, it's not written into the research, and it's not in the bell curve of normalcy. Injury prevention guidelines as well. We also look at dietary manipulations. When we do an audit of all the supplements that are primarily used in high-performance sport, the efficacy for women is not there because there are relatively few studies that have been done on popular sports supplements, but yet no one talks about it. Something as simple as, as nitrates, and we look at it as using as a vasodilator. When we look at premenopausal women or women in their reproductive years using nitrates, it's actually a hindrance to their performance because the nitrate interferes with their vasomotor um, aspects as well as the endothelial function of our blood vessels because nitric oxide is tightly tied to how estrogen makes our endothelial cells respond. But in postmenopausal women and late perimenopausal women, nitrates work great because we have a reduction in estrogen, so now that exogenous nitrate comes in and helps with vasodilation. So that's the only one that's been really well studied. We look at beta alanine, there's nothing really there for women. Creatine, now we're getting a large body of evidence for women, but it's only been in the recent past two or three years. So all the norms that we know, we have to really investigate and say, is it really appropriate for me as a woman where I am in my life? Or is it just been generalized over from male data? So I bring this up because when we think about what is success in sport, we have this image that you can't be fallible. We have to have power. We have to be aggressive. We have to show no fear. And these are the messages that are portrayed. So when we think about 20 years ago, which unfortunately that mentality still exists, if a woman were to lose her period, she was deemed to be fit enough to be successful in whatever event was coming up. But we now know that that is a sign that she is not well. But yet we still have this pervasive idea in sport that if you don't have a period, then that means that you are ready to go. And it falls back into having a period or a bleed phase is a fallibility and we don't want to talk about it. We are starting to see change, which is fantastic. We have more information about it and how it is beneficial, but it still is very much ingrained in the sporting culture because it's deemed as a fallibility that women aren't really that concerned about having it. They'd rather take an oral contraceptive pill so they can ignore it. So again, if we're only using masculine language and only men's sport is shown, especially on prime time, and society still gets the impression that that is the norm, then we are still pushing women back. So I want everyone to close their eyes. And I want you to think about a point in time when you were younger, 
where you might have had an encounter that really stuck with you that you felt wasn't quite right. For me, I remember when I was 17 and my dad asked me, what do you want to do with your life when you get older? What do you want to be when you grow up? And I said, I want to be an Army Ranger or a Navy SEAL. And he said, well, you can't because you are a girl. It was the very first time that I had pushback. Now, if you take it out of the stance of a personal event or something you've said to someone, and let's bring it into the norm now. If we walk into a normal 24-hour fitness, LA fitness, and you're a new person coming in, generally what happens as a woman, they'll say, how much weight do you want to lose? Here's the cardio. Here's the list of classes. If you're a guy coming in, they're like, great. How much weight do you want to gain? They're the lifting platforms because it's still very gendered. We're still working for it. So what I want people to understand is we are seeing a sea change. One of the sports that I really have a love-hate relationship with is CrossFit. Because one of the first things that CrossFit did was eliminate the whole gender disparity. It's like you have RX, if you're a man or a woman, this is what you do. Equal prize money. And it wasn't women, you're not strong enough, you can't do this. It was like, yeah, you're strong enough, let's do it. So it opened up a sea change, right? So now we're seeing Olympic lifting becoming more prevalent in a lot of the gyms. So like I said, there are small spaces around. So if we're talking about that, I want people's first thought to be about your beliefs and context and the way that language can shape perceptions. So like I said, what is a girl push-up? A girl push-up is just a push-up. A girl is doing a push-up. What is a modified push-up? On your knees or with a band? So we have to be very aware of the language that we are using, as well as the stance that we have. To create a safe environment, if you're uncomfortable with a woman coming up to you and talking to you about your menstrual cycle or some other things that are deemed girly, if you're standing there like this, it's going to create a very negative environment where even if you're uncomfortable and you have your hands down or behind your back, it opens up that space and allows that conversation. So there are things that we do in our day-to-day -day life and the language that we use that can really change and create a sea change to be more inclusive and opening up the awareness to allow women to not have to say, wait, I'm a woman, that's why that was said. It just is. We are there, you are there, everyone's involved in the conversation and we work together to make it better.